Guys, thanks for being here, the capacity crowd that we do have here. Um, Jack mentioned I am from Philadelphia. I am one of the little people. I'm not one of those guys speaking down from on high. Um, before we start, too, the, this is about me learning and experiencing and evolving this thing. So um, my best learning experience is from you guys, especially at the end. Um, like these slides and stuff that, uh, oh hey, you could use something here or something here or here's something that you may not have known. That is what I'm all about. You know, if you study history, I'm an amateur, very amateur historian. Um, if you study history, pretty quickly you learn to be very humble because everything that you know today, tomorrow they find a body or they find a foundation of a house or they find a document in somebody's attic that totally blows it out of the water. We'll talk about Betsy Ross at some point. Um, but we're going to talk about William Penn and the movement of liberty. I'll tell you a little story. The, um, what's really interesting, I think the theme for this year is liberty in motion. Am I right about that? Or something of that? I know it's something of that ilk. The, what resonated really much with me, really much, a lot with me, is the fact that, um, for instance, like last year, we, we signed on to do a show. This is my partner, Kayla, here. We signed on to do, we do a communication show. We do a history show, History Done Funny. We do a communication show called Chatterbox, basically how we've had language for 10,000 years and we've screwed it up for 10,000 years. Anywho, there is a Fringe Fest in Singapore that we signed up for. Late in the game, we found out it was, the theme was animals. So we took this communication theme show and just threw animals in there. Um, and it was basically me just trying um, any way I can to get to beautiful Singapore and have this, this goofy little show. Um, when this theme came up, Liberty in Motion, um, the first thing I thought of was William Penn because that was your first free state project or more appropriately, that was your first free province project, was William Penn. And we'll learn a little bit about that here. First, a little bit about me. Um, story mapping. A big uh, caveat before we, we start, I always start with a, a warning about story mapping. It's uh, or bad detective work. Number one, um, uh, story map is the, uh, what do they call it in the military when all the letters mean a, uh, like laser and scuba and stuff? Acronym. Somebody smart can tell. What is it? Acronym. Acronym. That's right. That's what the kids are calling it these days. Um, a map is metaphors, anchors, and priming expectations. If you start to believe something, if you see a couple of uh, clues, you know, there's a bloody trail, a knife, and the body over there, and um, you can start to form a, uh, an idea as to what the crime is and that may not be it exactly. Uh, so what I'm going to do, how this um, affects us, is I'm going to tell you a story. And hopefully the story, it's the story of a man's life and the story of liberty in motion. Um, hopefully it is compelling, but always have doubts, always have that grain of salt. Like I tell people on tours and stuff, you know, you're always gonna find the foundations of house that prove you wrong tomorrow. So I guess that's what I mean with that. Uh, metaphor, anchors, priming expectations. So there are two men in Philadelphia. That is basically all of Philadelphia. It's William Penn and Ben Franklin, or the Ben and Penn Show. Uh, and that is, you know, especially things invented, things done in Philadelphia. 99% is Ben Franklin. If he did half of what people say that he's done, he is still a phenomenal great man. That will be next year's uh, project. But this year, we are concentrating on William Penn. William Penn is this guy right here. There are two extant um, pictures of William Penn. This is the one that you see most of. This was when he was later in life, when he had gotten sallow and gaunt and a little bit bigger most of his life. Much like Ben Franklin, he was tall, athletic, and there you go. Um, here are a lot of the things that you will see around the Philadelphia area about William Penn. 
Um, so hopefully this will be an education, especially if you guys don't know much about William Penn. This is Welcome Park in here. This is named after the ship that William Penn came to Philadelphia on, came to Pennsylvania on. And that is a map of Philadelphia under there. And that statue there is William Penn there. An interesting side note, in his left hand he has the Charter of Privileges. You can see that sticking out there. And his right hand sticks out on, the, uh, on his right side. Coming down from Ben Franklin Parkway in Philadelphia, if you're looking at it just the right way, it looks like another part of his anatomy. But that is a total other uh, thing that you might enjoy if you look on, on YouTube or something like that. There's William Penn High School. There's uh, Penn Treaty Park. This is the place where the Great Treaty of Amity happened. The treaty between William Penn and Chief Taminant. Chief Taminant was the sachem of the local Lenape tribe. There were three tribes that William Penn dealt with, the, uh, the Shackamaxon, the, um, the Shawnee, and the Lenape. Ironically enough, most Indian tribes, their names mean real people or real men. Um, it's all in different languages, most of them, at least half of them. There's Penn's View, Penn Center, Penn's Landing, where uh, probably Penn made his first landing. Um, the Liberty Bell, why do I put that there? It came after William Penn. It literally came 50 years after his charter of privileges in 1700. It was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his charter of privileges, which gave us freedom of religion, assembly, and trial by jury. And there's Penn Jillette, another very, has nothing to do with William Penn, but his name is Penn. <laughs> and there's the statue on top of City Hall. That is a 37 foot statue. statue. His eyes are as big as your head. Uh, 40 tons, it is the largest statue on any building anywhere in the world. This is also the tallest masonry building in the world. You can see how it, the color changes on there. Um, it goes up masonry up to a certain point, up to about the, the clock there, and then it's iron for the rest of the way. Another side note, you'll see some statues on the underneath there, um, underneath William Penn. That's all that, uh, that dark bronze. Um, there are four figures. You can't see two of the figures, but um, two of the figures are Native Americans. Two of them are Swedes, the, uh, the original settlers of Philadelphia, of Pennsylvania. Why should you listen to me? Well, no reason, unless I'm entertaining for the most part. For many years I have done this, that, and some of this. This was in Australia doing our Chatterbox show. So I'm used to having crowds of people in front of me. Our unofficial sponsor today is Dogfish Head 60 Minute IPA. Why do I say that? Because I did most of this while drinking a six pack of that. Why the interest? Well, William Penn founded Pennsylvania. Ironically, it's not named after him. I'll tell you about that in just a little bit. Status Charter of Privileges. It's the template for the U.S. Constitution. Okay, freedom of religion, assembly, trial by jury. This is William Penn as a young man. Uh, first two years of his life, he got smallpox, lost all of his hair. So that is a wig. So, and there is him later in life. These are the two pictures of him that we uh, that we know are from real life. It's unfortunate that we use this picture because it's a uh, it's a big fat guy. Um, for most of his life, he was a, a pretty lean fellow, and it's certainly not this guy. This is our Quaker Oats fella. Uh, there may be some resemblance, especially with the hat, but this is not William Penn, first great hero of American liberty, who said this. That guy, Jim Powell, he is an associate with the, uh, the Cato Institute. He wrote a really great uh, piece. Um, it's called William Penn, America's First Great Champion for Liberty and Peace. I found it on www.quaker.org. It is a, a really nice article, um, and it's one, it really sums everything up. I have uh, begged, stolen, and, uh, and grabbed much of this information from his, his piece. William Penn, the Movement of Liberty. Here's the nitty gritty. Who was the man? Where did he come from? How did he form these ideas? Well, he's born in Tower Hill. That is one of the, the better suburbs of London. That's like uh, we would have Rittenhouse Square here. I'm sure there's a, uh, uh, an equal place up here that's, uh, that's your, uh, your more well-to-do place. He was born with hair. After two years, he doesn't have hair. This is Caillou. This is his baptismal font. This actually comes from, uh, from England. This is the font that's in Philadelphia right now. 
and they bring it. They brought it to Christ Church, basically to prove that William Penn was baptized as an Anglican. He changed his religion later to Quakerism. Um, that's basically a remember. Remember what we started as. That piece is about this high. It comes up almost to your belly button. Um, that's a lid on top. You lift that off. It is something like 100 to 200 pounds. It takes at least two people to lift that lid off. Really nice piece. And there's his dad. So the difference between the two people, the, his name is William too, but he's Admiral Penn. Uh, very famous for knowing the waters off of England and Ireland and being able to navigate those waters and to keep a crew in line. Because at times they can be quite scary. So he's the, the famous Admiral Penn. He serves under Charles II, who looks a lot like Captain Hook. And Oliver Cromwell. So he, he serves the Stuarts and he serves the Parliament. Um, basically, conflict of interest? Yes, he's burning a candle at two ends. Why does he do all this? He's, it, well, it's, it helps him to set up a mini empire. And who does he do that, do that empire for? William Penn. It's Caillou, but that's uh, bald kid means William Penn. Um, all William Penn has to do is keep his nose clean. All he has to do is study, dress nice, and not get into too much trouble. And his life is set before him. Um, he studies to be a lawyer. He will have um, you know, a house, property. He's got lands in Ireland, lands in England. Um, but the story doesn't go quite like that. Um, he goes to Oxford. He's kind of a ruffian. He uh, speaks out. He talks against the Trinity and um, some of these uh, protocols against uh, tolerance and humanism. He meets a guy there called John Owen. John Owen had actually taught at Oxford, the, uh, the Chigwell School in Oxford, um, and he was dismissed for his uh, uh, tolerant teachings. So this was not something that was um, part of everyday life. It was revolutionary back then. And some people say revolutionary today as well. His dad sent him to France. This is l'Académie Protestante. This is the French Huguenot Academy in there to learn divinity. And then finally he goes to Lincoln's Inn. This is probably the most important learning uh, institution that William Penn goes to. Um, this is where he is taught about common law being the basis of civil liberties. He gets taught um, the protocol of a court case, basically how to walk and talk like a lawyer. Because at this point, um, Quakerism, you have leaders that don't have, you know, they're, they're, very, um, they're very charming, they're very affable, um, they're very um, hot about what they're, they're talking about. Not very educated, so it was a boon to have William Penn in their ranks. So he plucks him out of the um, Lincoln Inn. He brings him, his father that is, Admiral Penn, brings William onto his ship with him, the Royal Charles. Why does he do that? He wants him to learn how to, how to lead men. And what better place than to do it right here, where he's doing it right on the spot. And they're also, this is when um, England is gearing up for a war against the Dutch. So he does that, then he sends him back to England as a messenger. What does that do? That puts him in contact with Charles II and the Duke of York, who would later become James II. And he can use those, uh, those relationships to his advantage. Advantage? Advantagement? He travels through Ireland, they have estates all around um, that, that small, um, the picture, the early picture of William Penn, um, you might have noticed he's in armor. Um, there was about five minutes when he decided he wanted to be a soldier. Um, he's in armor and that's at Carrick Fergus in, in Ireland. Um, he decides very quickly after that, I'm not doing that. This is George Fox, he's the Fox. He is the one who uh, came up with Quakerism. Um, and he's a very close friend of William Penn. So William Penn, finally, he's, you know, he's, he's basically um, hanging out with the Quakers for a while, finally decides to join the Society of Friends. Um, there is a story about one of the first meetings that he goes to. Um, the, uh, the soldiers come in, they arrest 
the Quakers, they say, oh, here's a guy who's got some nice clothing on. Uh, we're going to let him go. And, and William Penn says, no, I'm a Quaker. You're going to take me in, too. Uh, and that was the first, literally the first time, you know, on the spot, he said, that's it. This is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. The trial. They bring him in for treason. Um, there are a lot of things that you can, uh, a lot of crimes that you can pin on a Quaker. Um, we'll go over that in just a little bit. It's very easy to put a Quaker in jail. Anyway, there is a trial. Um, the, the Lord Mayor of London is the judge in this trial. So they, they have the proceedings. Um, William Penn is so golden-tongued that he convinces the jury that he's innocent. The jury comes back with their verdict and says, um, let this guy go. He's done nothing wrong. The judge, at this point, can do anything he wants with the jury. He says, okay, William, you're in contempt of court, you're going to jail, and jury, you're going to jail. They're all going to Newgate Prison, which is one of the worst prisons in England, all because they had a verdict that the judge didn't like. Um, they, uh, they wrote, they, uh, they battled that, they finally got out, but that is what started is the crusade for trial by jury. And through the rest of his life, uh, he's, he's on that crusade. Why are Quakers being persecuted? Well, you can also, yeah. I just wanted to mention that at 2 o'clock in, I'm not sure which venue, but uh, we're doing a staged reading, or a reading of a play based on the trial. Oh, how about, oh, I'm totally going to be there. Cool. But right. I think it's on our schedule. Yeah, it's on our schedule. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's creating communities there. That's brilliant. Oh, That's brilliant. I'm totally there. Cool. See if you, you need an extra reader. I do. <laughs> certainly jump in. Um, so why are Quakers being per persecuted? The same reason Catholics are, the same reason Dunkers and Schwenkfelders are. Uh, except they have a little, a, a couple extra reasons, a couple extra uh, hooks that they can get in them. Um, number one, uh, a lot of people are joining Quakers. So that means you've got people leaving your church if you're another uh, religion and you're not getting any money from them. They, uh, the quitrians and stuff. So here are the tactics against the Quakers. So Quakers can't swear. You know about being in a, uh, in a courtroom ses setting, you put your hand on the Bible, you swear to the Bible, etc., etc. Um, they won't swear to anything. So just that in and of itself, all you have to do is get a Quaker in court and you can put them in jail for contempt of court because they will not swear. They also will not take their hats off. They will not bow to anyone. They have this crazy idea of equality. I say crazy, I love the idea. Um, but that is why they, they won't take their hats off. And that is another thing that you have to do in court at this time is you have to be a subservient to the state. Uh, traveling, there's a few other traveling Christian Sabbath, uh, vagrancy, um, I have no stories about that, but I suppose there are vagrants at some point. Last for me, um, they refuse to take off, take arms, and um, the other one is their, their liturgy is different from the established liturgy of the established church. Um, so any one of those, you can grab a Quaker right into court. Um, that's why a lot, of the, uh, a lot of their services were in houses. Uh, penalties, fines, imprisonment, sent to the Caribbean, which right now sounds like it would be a great thing back then. It was not. You were sent into slavery. You were sent into the sugar farms. In fact, there's a great story about Cotton Mather and William Penn. William Penn is coming. The, the Quakers and the Puritans are, are at odds with each other. Um, Cotton Mather up in, for me in Philly, it's, it's up in Massachusetts, but here, I think it's down. Um, Cotton Mather hears that William Penn is going to take some of his Quakers and start this new colony of Pennsylvania. Um, the story is, I cannot substantiate it, except there is one letter that says so. Um, the story is that he is going to have them captured and sent down to, to the Caribbean and be sold into slavery. That is how serious it is. So, you know, if that would happen, we would never have this story. Prison and pamphlets, he sent to prison six times. Uh, once a few times to Newgate, uh, once in the Tower of London. He uses that time to do a lot of thinking, a lot of writing. Here's a great picture of it. He's in the prison, the Tower of London, for six months. In the Tower of Lon London, he writes the Sandy Foundation Shaken. 
that is a uh, that is um, a, a book on the uh, on the Trinity. The uh, it's an anti-Trinity book. Um, no cross, no crown. That is basically up until this point there was no there was no handbook for Quakerism because as as I said, none of them were of the learned class. This was the first time that you had someone who was learned in both um, the legal system and writing and communication, which he does for the rest of his life. Coming to America. So there is a colony of Quakers in western New Jersey. In fact, William Penn is one of the, uh, one of the main members of that. He stays in England, but he, uh, he facilitates that. And it is very successful. Um, at this point, he finds we are getting so big that we can't stay here. There's just too much going on. Um, everyone's being put in prison. So he petitions the king for some land. Um, he gained experience uh, from that New Jersey project. He petitions the king for land. The king finally gives him 45,000 square miles. That's basically what would become Pennsylvania. I mean, first off, I should say this is land the king says, okay, you can just have this land. That's not that there wasn't anyone on that land. We'll get, that, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, he decides he wants to call it New Wales because um, uh, Penn is a... Uh, uh, traditionally, they are uh, a Welsh family, though his mother was Dutch. Um, he goes against that, he, he wants to call it Sylvania. Sylvania means woods. Well, the king says, that's great, you can call it that. Why don't you call it Pennsylvania? Name it after your dad. William says, um, I don't really want to do that. I'm a Quaker, we don't really name things after people. So they, he doesn't end around with that. Pen actually means, in Welsh, it means head. Sylvania means woods, so it kind of means head of woods or opening to woods or something. That's how he gets around there, but it's named after his dad. There's Pennsylvania right there. Beautiful, beautiful Pennsylvania. There's the state of Pittsburgh on the left and the state of Philadelphia on the right and uh, something else in between. That's a lot of people there. Who does he bring? Well, first he comes in on his ship, the Welcome. You might have seen the uh, Welcome Park that uh, William... The, the statue of William Penn was, was in. Um, this is the ship, the welcome, the actual ship. He brings the Dunkers, the Catholics, Schwenkfelders, German Mennonites, Moravians, French Huguenots, Scots-Irish Presbyterians, English Baptists, the Amish, and there's a few more that I can't even remember the names. Establishing a utopia. Well, there is no utopia. There's always a dark underbelly of of uh, utopias, there's always something that you don't see. It might look pretty on the outside, like this picture, but it certainly isn't that on the inside. There's a, hard, a lot of hard work to do with it. But he came, I think, as close as you can. Uh, private property, free enterprise, free press, trial by jury, and religious toleration. They, I have a thought of William Penn. He had a lot of good ideas, a lot. He was an idea man. And he was really good at speaking and getting people excited about things. After that, maybe wasn't so great at administration, um, making money off of it. He never made any money off of Pennsylvania. In fact, at one point, he says, I think I lost 30,000 30, pounds off of this enterprise. It screams, oh, Pennsylvania. Um, Native Americans, these are the folks that are already living there. Now, the king can give away land all that he wants, um, willy-nilly, without thinking of anyone who might actually be living there. The first person to think of them is William Penn. Probably the, the first and only good deal that natives ever got was William Penn coming over and basically saying to them, hey, look, the king gave, gave me this land. I know I don't really have it, so if you're amenable to this, I'm going to pay you for this land which is, is crazy town if you ask any other Englishman at that time, or many other Englishmen at that time. Um, so they have the famous um, treaty, the, the great treaty of which Voltaire ser says was never signed and never broken, and that lasts for about 70 years, the longest of those treaties anywhere in the United States. It's also why Philadelphia doesn't have a wall around it. Literally, you have a Wall Street in New York, that was the wall that the Dutch put up against the natives. We never had to fight the natives. In fact, William Penn would learn 
their language, or at least the, the accents and some of the major words, to be able to speak to them without a, a translator, which once again was crazy town. Nobody would do that. The anniversary of that is tomorrow. It's super. Let's, let's assume that I, I was thinking ahead. And of course, I have absolutely. That. Sure, why, why wouldn't I do it on the anniversary? Everyone to celebrate. <laughs> Most of my life is dumb luck, and that's a, a perfect example of it. It's a great story. We, we could talk. We could have, the, like, the whole theme could be William and Penn. Um, that would make me happy. Um, so there's the language. Uh, that, that's actually a better picture of William Penn. Um, this is him uh, around the, the Great Treaty. This is, he's 38 years old. He only gets sallow and fat when he's, when he's even older than that, after he's past 50, 55. And here's the, the famous picture, uh, Benjamin West picture of the Great Treaty, um, which one, William Penn, is once again fat. Um, from what I've been told, all of the uh, clothing styles are, are old-fashioned or, or 20 years out of date either direction. Um, but it is a great picture, and this uh, I think, if I'm if I remember correctly, this is in the uh, the uh, the art museum in Philadelphia, where the Rocky Steps are. This is also this you'll see this um, this insignia in a lot of places. This just happens to be one Strawberry Jim Clothier, um, which I don't think is running anymore, but it was their uh, the logo for their store. That's Chief Tamanin on the left, and William Penn on the right. That sign of friendship amity and confidence. Uh, Chief Tamanin later on would be known as you'd have Tammany Societies, um, Tammany Hall in New York, um, you know, eventually that would become corrupt, but um, that was the idea you would have Saint Tammany, was the, uh, was the saint of America, and that's, that's him. He was uh, uh, supposed to be a very wise rule, very wise cycle. Obstacles. Well, there was a uh, a guy in uh, Maryland, Lord Baltimore. Um, he said, "Hey, you know what? The 40th parallel is a little bit farther north than what you think it is, William Penn." Um, William Penn, he wasn't such a great map maker, I guess, um, or didn't think about it. Uh, it was a great idea. Man. Um, so there were actually uh, Marylanders who were saying that Philadelphia was the greatest, prettiest city in Maryland. Um, in fact, that's why William Penn goes back to England. One of the reasons he goes back to England is to settle this dispute between Pennsylvania and Maryland. You can see the Mason-Dixon line on there. That doesn't come about until 1768. Um, that's what finally settles that dispute between Pennsylvania and Maryland. And then they add Delaware in there later on as well. Can you indicate how high that line was? The, the Mason-Dixon line itself? Yeah. Is that what you're looking for? I mean, this is the, the literally the border between. Um, I understand that. And the question is, where was it before that? So oh, that was the no. It was always. Oh, it has there. Been, it has I mean, the, I mean, it was a difference between something like that, just enough, because uh, Philadelphia uh -huh. is right here. I see. So um, Lord Baltimore was saying, "Hey, Philadelphia is in Maryland. So here's the line up here." Um, right. William Penn was like, no, it's down here. And it was finally Mason Dixon who, uh, who proved it. So the other thing was the William Penn receives 45,000 square miles, which becomes Pennsylvania. He basically chops it. It looks like a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet when he cuts it out. This is all looking on a map in England before they've gotten out there. He becomes a real estate agent. Excuse me. You get a... Uh, you get a plot of land in Philadelphia, that can be your home territory, your base. You get a certain amount of land in the Liberty Lands, which is right outside Philadelphia. And then you get um, 50 plus acres in Pennsylvania somewhere. So you can do your farming and stuff. Um, and literally he's looking at a map, cutting out these plots of land. What he doesn't realize at the time, and I would make the same mistake, is all of this land is not equal, especially in Philadelphia, which is swamps and rivers and, and creeks. One guy's land has a giant creek going through it, the other guy is on swamp, another guy has the best land ever. Um, so there's beautiful land, there is not so much beautiful land. So between, um, between that property dispute, that boundary dispute, and all of these um, unhappy clients, 
um, he had to go back to England to try and figure that out. He also had a third thing he was dealing with. Let me see what I have here. Um, he had a uh, an assistant, a friend of his, who was helping him. Um, never put much responsibility to friends. Um, Philip Ford. Philip Ford basically at one point. Um, well, we'll talk about Ben Franklin being on the run, but um, Philip Ford was um, him and his wife Bridget. Whenever I read through that story, it reminds me of Macbeth and Macbeth's wife saying, kill him, kill him, do that. He's not a murderer, but um, pushing him to, to do awful things. Um, these, both of them were kind of awful people, but we'll get into that in just a little bit. So the witch trials, the first Pennsylvania witch trial, we all know about the Salem witch trials in Massachusetts, what, 19 people hanged for being a witch. We have one in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. Um, before William Penn, before the English get there, there are Swedes in Philadelphia. They populate most of the land. Um, there is a woman called uh, Margaret Madsen. She is a Swede. She doesn't even speak English, or she speaks broken English. Um, we have there. So they, uh, they accuse her for being a witch. I think it's souring the milk is what they say has happened in several of the cows of sour milk. Um, they bring her to trial. This is 1683. William Penn is presiding over this trial. And they, they first off, he knows that this is a joke. He knows, just, just like in Salem, a lot of this is just kind of greed. It's just kind of, oh, you accuse someone of witchcraft, then they give up all their rights to land and stuff. Um, it's, it's humans being at their worst. So anyway, she is accused of witchcraft. Um, she has a partner in that too, that I forget her name. Um, she's got an exotic name. Um, so they question her. They get her up on, on, on the stand. And basically, I'll, I'll boil this down to its, its component parts. Um, it is said, and truth is probably close to this, William Penn says to her, he says, okay, have you ever gotten on a broom and flown through the skies of Philadelphia? Margaret, not knowing the language very well, misunderstands it. She nods yes. What William Penn does is, well, no one ever said that was against the law. So he gives her a fine, he gives her husband a fine, and, and that's the end of that. He's, she is accused of the common fame of being a witch, but not the practice, um, which I think is the only judgment of that case in the history of the United States, and it's William Penn just being smart. He's saying, I know this is bullshit. You want to play this game? I'm the lawyer. You, we can do this. We can do this. I will make this charade up. We'll have some fun with this. Um, and thank God, because um, you know, as you saw with Salem, it could be a horrible thing. Like I said, people being at their, their worst. This is the other woman who is involved, Yeshua Hendrickson. Um, this is another. It's a movie that has to be made, or a play that has to be written. So enter William of Orange. So we've had um, Charles II, we've had James II, um, and they were the Stuart line. Um, they were friendly towards William Penn, his father. Um, William of Orange comes in. At this point, William is back in England. Um, William of Orange comes to power, um, and he accuses William Penn of treason. So now William Penn is on the run. For four years he lives in the slums of London, um, hiding out probably with, with other Quakers um, so that he doesn't get dragged in. All the while, some of his, fr his Quaker friends are working to get him free, to get his name cleared. Um, and there's one very famous friend who happens not to be a Quaker, John Locke, who's a close friend of William Penn. And he is very instrumental in getting William's name cleared in London so that he can walk the streets again. So here's him, 93, four years. This gives you the idea. There it is, Quaker friends and John Locke there. So I'm saying, getting ahead of myself here. Meanwhile, back in Pennsylvania, we're at the, the about that 30 years, 1690 to 1720, is called the golden age of piracy. And Philadelphia, ironically enough, is one of the uh, one of the centers of piracy. They, they even say that Blackbeard came into Philadelphia, hid some gold on uh, what we call uh, Blackwell's Island, which is in the center of the Delaware River, where, where Philadelphia is situated. Um, it could be, but I'm not going out with a, a spade just yet. Um, but there is a lot of things going on while William is away in England. He's away for 18 years. 
He's not in Philadelphia for more than four years in total when he is there. Basically two years um, in 1682 and then a couple years in, around 1700 when he comes back. So he comes back, he creates the Charter of Privileges. Um, I give tours of Philadelphia. Um, why is Philadelphia so historically important? Two things. The Charter of Privileges gave you freedom of religion, trial by jury, and assembly. Second was it was equidistant between New York, between New England and Virginia. So all the delegates for the first time on the convention, the second time on the convention, didn't have as far to go. It's the easiest place to get to for everyone. And that's why it's so important. Charter of Privileges is your first constitution or your template for the constitution. And it's the first time that you have all of those freedoms in one place. So so people in Pennsylvania, people in Philadelphia were used to those freedoms. They were used to that, that fertile ground. That's not to say that it was, you know, you, you had total freedom. Um, you could only vote or hold office if you were a Christian. So sorry atheists, sorry Jews. So Philip Ford, he is the uh, the fellow who's sort of like Macbeth. He's the he's kind of a heel. Um, he offers to sell um, the deed back to uh, actually his wife offers to sell the deed back to William Penn as William Penn was in um, when he was hiding from the king. William of Orange, he basically sells the deed to Philip Ford to protect Pennsylvania from, from getting taken away. Well, Philip Ford decides, oh, I'll sell this back to you, puts it in his will. He dies, his wife Bridget says, okay, for uh, I think it's 11,000 pounds, there you go, you can have this state back. Um, everyone, Will, William Penn says, this is no good. Eventually, uh, England says, you're right, this is no good. Um, they decide uh, the king lowers the fee, and finally William Penn gets his friends to pay that fee. There we go, that's him jumping for joy. Um, during that process, um, he has a ser series of three strokes. Um, you know, the minor one in 1712, the two pretty major ones, that put him out of commission in 1713. He lives for about five more years um, trying to sell the province back to England, but it winds up, because of these strokes, staying in the family up until the revolution. His sons, his family, are nothing like William Penn. In fact, his son, uh, uh, Thomas Penn, um, institutes the walking purchase. If you know anything about the walking purchase, um, they, they come up with a contract with the, the, the natives, the Lenape. They say, um, hey, we'll buy some land from you. And they say, all right, we'll give you as much land as a man can walk in a day. So they find three best runners in Pennsylvania and down the, uh, down the East Coast to run as far as they can. They get up to, uh, to Easton. From Philadelphia to Easton is, I know it's, a, uh, it's like two or three hours drive. So. Um, they put the swindle on the Native Americans, and that pretty much ends that 70 years of, of free trade and amity between uh, the Penn family and the, uh, and the Native Americans. And then by the time uh, Ben Franklin comes in, there is real animosity between the Penns, the proprietors, and most of the citizenry. So uh, I think that gets capacitated. Uh, and that's the uh, those puppy ones say. Um, so it's a uh, it was a great idea, um, and you know I guess if we can boil it down, you know get great ideas and find really good friends to help you uh, to bring it to fruition. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I, any questions or anything? I can't promise an answer, but at least we can have a good discussion about it. Thanks, guys. That's the honest truth. The um, and we've been talking about that for days. The I have no answer for you. Um, and, and, and each of the, you know, the, I read one big book and a few articles, so I feel like an, I'm an expert. But all of those authors basically say the same thing. 
oh, pff, I, I don't know what he was thinking. Um, even the, the earliest abolitionists are Quakers. But that's 50 years after he's dead. Um, uh, ben Franklin was a slave owner. You know, all of that, you know they, they come to their senses after a while, but I wish I had an answer for you. Um, I, I can only I imagine. It seems like that's a huge blank in history. The only thing I can offer you, I mean, it, I'm just conjecturing here, is like, hey, they, their bodies are different. You know, the same thing for African Americans. Um, God has put the mark of Cain on them in some way, so it is our duty to um, to keep them. It, you know, I can only imagine what they what the logic was. Um, not feeling it at all myself, um, but that's my only, the only thing I think, it, it, think even close to an answer, like, which is not at all. So I've severely disappointed you. I'm sorry, <laughs> but thanks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, on that same topic, uh, so I've done just a little bit of reading as far as finding out about William Penn, and I've come up across with that he was a slave trader. The aspect of the, the treaty that lasts for 70, 70 years, is that's just good business. And he may have learned that leadership from his dad, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so you do have this as far as they thought of the Indians as a separate species back then at that time and, and stuff like that. And, and you know, it's all about the salvation of the Indians, uh, right, just like right. what you kind of have going on in, 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 in Africa now uh, with the evangelicals. Um, and you've had that through, you know, throughout a time memorial. I'm wondering if you found out any other things, because uh, I came across some things as far as uh, William Penn, especially later on in the utopian ex experiment, he cracks down and, and starts oppressing people, and the freedom of, certain freedoms are, are repressed, and uh, becomes kind of influential in that aspect. I'm just wondering if you, if you turned up uh, anything like that. And, uh, it's just like a couple of mentions that I've, I've gotten in my readings, and it's something that I want to research more, but I'm just curious if you can come across anything. They, uh, I can't in, enlighten you way too much, uh, only in that, um, you know, for, for me, at least the main idea was... He almost becomes Puritan in some sense. Uh, yeah, which, which is really interesting, they, uh, given the friction that the Puritans and the, and the Quakers had. Because literally, I, I think some of you guys weren't here. There is a letter that said, Cotton Mather wants them sent into slavery when, when William Penn's coming over. Um, yeah, all, all I can imagine, like, I think a lot of these, these things with William Penn come down to great ideas, awesome ideas, bad administrations. Is it just like, uh, good they're, they're good for entrepreneurial ideas, it's not so much that it's his interpretation, it's his, his utopia right. that he's trying to design. So it's not so much freedom, but like maybe good business as well? Uh, yeah, I, 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 think the, uh, I think that's definitely, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think all of this is good business. You know, even the, uh, even the, the, the good name was put on there. And I think, I, I think deep in his heart, he was like, this is what I, I really want, I think, you know, Spread this goodness, the uh, the inner light. That was that's the uh, the Quaker principle. Without going, you know, me who's not a Quaker, I can't explain all of it. But the um, you know, I think that's the um, the main gist uh, of that. Um, but yeah, I can't enlighten any any much further on that because um, I have to I have to do much more research mm -hmm. as well. The half of this, most of this, is about me learning from you guys rather than the other way around. <laughs>